Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, to the rest of the chapter. Give you a moment to, to find that. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 through 14. Please stand as we hear from God's holy, inerrant, inspired word. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And... You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Um, what comes to mind when you think of angels? You know, it was funny, uh, just as we were reading, let all gods worship him, let all gods angels worship him, excuse me. Uh, my little one was screaming out loud. Uh, so perhaps that's not what comes to mind. But maybe you think of little babies. You think of angels, you think, oh, little babies. All of us are affected by, you know, our cultural milieu, and so let me, let me point out an example of how we're affected by our cultural uh, culture around us. What do you think of when you think of devils? You probably think of a red man with horns, a pitchfork, and a forked tail. Something like that, right? That's, that's the popular imagination. If you read in the Bible, you're not going to see that image anywhere or anything similar to that. In the same way, I imagine that when you think, when I say the word angel, or you think, you hear that word, angels, you're thinking of what? Cute, harmless little babies with little wings. By the way, that image of, babe, of angels as babies first developed in the, in the time of the Renaissance. Okay, I think it was uh, the artist Raphael who first... Uh, painted angels as babies. Before that time, angels were not depicted as babies, but that, that's, a more, that's a more recent development. All right, if someone says to you, you're such an angel, what are they saying about you? They're saying you're caring, you're nice, you're good. Uh, angels, they're, they're like innocent figures. They're, they're almost cute. But then, when we look in the Bible, we see that angels do not come across as cute or even innocent. Angels come across as powerful. Uh, figures that would cause us to tremble in fear. In the Bible, angels are not cute little cherubs. Uh, they incite fear in our hearts. You think about even back all the way to Genesis 3. Remember when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden? Um, God wanted to prevent them. God prevented them from coming back into the garden to eat from the tree of life. And so what did God do? He placed a cherubim at the, at the east gate. The cherubim with their flaming swords. 
And so this, this is not some cute baby saying, don't come in. No, these, these are fearsome warriors who would strike fear into the hearts of anyone who would approach them and would cut them with, burning, with a burning sword if they tried. Angels in the Bible are powerful. They are sent by God to do his bidding. Uh, and there are several, I, off the top of my head, I can think of several scenes, several scenes where God defeats armies, these great armies. For example, the um, Assyrian army, I believe, over 120,000 soldiers were defeated by an angel. Not just defeated, an angel went out and just killed them all with one fell swoop. You're all dead now. And they all died. All right? That's how strong angels are. Now, I say all that because part of the challenge of us properly understanding this pas passage before us is I think we need to have an appropriate sense of the majesty and the power of angels. If you recall from last week, the author of Hebrews has introduced to us we already know, but he's introducing in, in his book, in his letter, the person and the work of the Son. But having done that, he goes on to compare the Son with angels for the rest of this chapter. And not only the rest of this chapter, he compares the Son with angels for chapter 2 as well. For almost two whole chapters, the author of Hebrews feels the need to, to do this. Why? because he has a higher view of angels compared to us. We don't have as high a view of angels. We think they're sort of cartoony figures, but in fact, he feels the need to do this um, because of, he has, a, we might say, a more biblical understanding of what they are. So he doesn't leave it simply at verse 4. If you have your Bible open before you, you can see that in verse 4, he says, the author of Hebrews says, that the Son is superior to angels just as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. He already says that, but then he goes on in, into our passage, the one we just read, verses 5 through 14, and he quotes from seven different Old Testament passages in order to prove that same point. And what is that point again? That the Son is superior to angels. Now, let me make a, a confession to you. I have read the book of Hebrews uh, many times be before, and usually this is, to me, sort of the boring part of Hebrews, and so usually what I've done when I've read through Hebrews before is I would skim through, or I would speed read across this, this chapter. Well, I would read the first four verses, very, very good stuff there, and then verses 5 through 14, I will speed through, because... It seems, after all, it seems that he's just saying the same thing over and over again from the Old Testament. Okay, I get it. Yes, Jesus is superior to angels. I get it. Now, on the one hand, yes, that is mainly what this passage is about. But on the other hand, there is much more here than what's merely on the surface. God's Word is a deep ocean. We can, we can just settle for what's on the surface, but if, you, if we sit with a passage, if we um, study and, 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 and think about it deeply. If we meditate on a passage, we, we find that, in fact, there's much more than what's on the surface. There are deep waters here. So it behooves us, therefore, to think deeply about this passage before us and not to just pass by uh, what wonderful things we might behold if we took the time to do so. Now, as I've already mentioned, this passage is basically a string of seven quotations from the Old Testament. Now, if you've ever read through the New Testament, you find this happens a lot. New Testament authors happen to, very often, quote from the Old Testament. What are they doing? They're trying to prove a point from the Old Testament. Or they try to demonstrate how a prophecy from the Old Testament has been fulfilled. Maybe they're trying to show how Jesus is the Messiah that the Old Testament foretold. Let's take a quick poll. A poll is a vote. It's sort of like a vote, okay? There are three votes that are allowable. Yes, no, and abstain, meaning you don't vote. 
Okay. How many of you go back and read the quoted Old Testament passage? When you come across, when you're reading and you see a quote from the Old Testament, how many of you go back and see, what does it say back there? Yes. Who says yes? Who says no? Okay. And who abstains from the boats? Okay, you abstainers, I guess you don't read the Bible. No, just kidding. Really, this question, I ask you this because there's a greater question here. How many of you would consider yourself students of the Bible? Who here, cons- this is not a poll, this is just for, your, for yourself. Do you, cons- how many of you are students of the Bible? Most Bibles have footnotes containing references for the direct quotation. So if you have your Bible open and you're looking at verse 5 and it says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And you look at the, right before the you, you're going to see a little letter. Probably an A. Who here sees an A in front of you? Who's, who's doing what I'm telling them to Look at verse 5. You are my son. If you look at the you, you're going to see a little letter in front of the, in front of the you. Who sees a, a letter in front of the you? Okay. And you look down. A footnote is you look down, and you're going to find an A somewhere in the bottom of your Bible. And that A contains the Old Testament passage from where the author of Hebrews quoted. Whoever's doing that, tell me, where is you are my son today I've begotten you from? Um, I told you this morning, so you can't answer. Psalm? Huh? Psalm 2, verse 7. That's right. The second passage, if you look, you can do the same exact thing. You find that the second passage is from 2 Samuel Chapter 7, verse 14, and so on. That's how you can find where is the New Testament author quoting from the Old Testament. Now, let me just, as an aside, uh, exhort you to be a student of the Bible. Part of our discipleship is to become students of the Bible. That is... You know, that's part of what disciple, being a disciple is. We are a student of Jesus. Yes, we are all students of Jesus, just like the original disciples were. But the thing is, uh, Jesus is not giving us lectures right now, but in fact, he has given us his word. The lecture notes are all here. And so in in that sort of silly analogy, we understand to to be student of the word is to be a student of Jesus, to be his disciple. Because even as much as we are, as we gather together to receive the means of grace, we receive the means of grace, the word is being preached to you, you receive communion uh, once a month, we pray together. This means of grace, when we worship together, is the primary way that God feeds his people. But, but also there's, a, there's another way that God feeds his people, through the word, when we s- study it ourselves, when we become students of the Bible. So again, I exhort you to become students of the Bible. Now, how can you become a student of the Bible if you don't study it? Right? It's in the word, student, study. They go together. To be a student of the Bible, you must try to grow in your understanding of the word right? There has, to, there has to be a certain curiosity about how do the various parts of the Bible fit together? Because there is, in fact, a logic. There, there is a fitness to the, the way the Old and the New Testament, for example, fits together. It is, as, one, as certain theologians have called it, a beautiful tapestry. You know what a tapestry? It's a beautiful, uh, I don't want to say rug. Rug sounds really low, but it's, it's a beautiful carpet that's just weaved together 
And the various parts of the Bible, they fit together. They're not just like random junk that's sewn together, but it's one whole picture, different parts. You know, if you don't take the effort to go back and read the passage from where quotations come from, you will inevitably think that the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is a quote book. Do you know what a quote book is? A quote book is a book uh, that, you know, that sometimes uh, if, you're, if you have to write essays or if you have to do public speaking, you have a quote book full of randomly assorted quotes for special occasions. Oh, I got to talk about this. You pull out the quote book. Ah, this is a good quote to use in my speech. Or for those of you who don't, who, who don't use quote books, you, ju you can just use a dictionary. Miriam Webster says that the word uh, understanding is defined as, who, who has ever started a speech that way or, or an essay that way? Uh, the thing about dictionaries or, or encyclopedias or quote books is that you don't study them, right? They're just there as a reference. You use it when you need something out of it. You use a quote book to get quotes whenever you have a different point to make. And perhaps that is your vague understanding of the Old Testament. It's only there for you to pull a quote if you need to make some kind of point, such as here, Psalm 2-7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. This is an obvious prophecy that Jesus is the Son of God. Perhaps that's what you think of the Old Testament. But when you become a student of the Bible and you become curious about how the various parts fit together and you go back and you read Psalm 2, you'll find that, wait, it's not, it's not automatically clear how this psalm is about Jesus. Or when you read 2 Samuel chapter 7, if you've ever read it in context, you might come away scratching your head thinking, how is this verse exactly about Jesus? Because if you, actually, if you read about, we'll talk about it later, it's, it seems to be about Solomon. You're going to come up with, you're going to, you're going to, the questions are going to be raised if you study the Bible. Just like if you really study any other subject, it's going to raise questions because things are actually more complex than, than you know, the, the, the surface level of things. And what are some questions that will be raised? You're going to wonder, what is going on here? Is the author of Hebrews, and not just the author of Hebrews, but the other writers of the New Testament, are they just playing fast and loose with the, with the, Old, Testament, with the Old Testament text? Are they using the Old Testament like a quote book? How should we understand the Old Testament? In fact, Jesus teaches us how we ought to read the Old Testament. Jesus said something very important about this. Uh, we, taught, we went through this because we went through the Gospel of Luke, but uh, we'll go through it again because, you know, chances are you probably forgot it. At the end of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, after his resurrection, Jesus appears to different groups of disciples. Once he appears to two men going to Emmaus, and another time he appears to his own disciples, the twelve, well, the eleven at that point. And he, and he teaches these two different groups of people the same thing, which is what? That all the scriptures are actually about him. So, for example, in Luke 24, verse 27, Jesus says, it's not Jesus says, Luke, Luke says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Not just, not just one or two random verses, but all the scriptures are about him. That's what Jesus says. And then down in verse 44 of Luke 24, Jesus says this, Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Did you hear that? Everything written about me in the law, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that's the whole Bible, must be fulfilled. And so what is, what is Jesus teaching us? What does he teach the disciples about the Old Testament? 
Let me tell you, let me tell you this is not what he's saying. He's not saying that any random verse that you pick in the Old Testament has a, has a one-to-one direct connection to him. You know, if I did this, ah, Daniel chapter 4, verse 33. Let's see what it says here. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were as bird's claws. See, this verse shows that Jesus was a wild man. No, that's not, that's not how we should read the Old Testament, okay? You, we, you don't randomly select and say, yes, that's about Jesus. In fact, that was about Nebuchadnezzar. Rather, Jesus is saying something about the overall shape of the Old Testament. And this is the overall shape, ready? The Old Testament is building up it's, it's building up toward something or someone. When you read the Old Testament, especially when you get to the end, you find that it is not a finished picture. The Old Testament explicitly and implicitly, in many different ways, it is expecting fulfillment. In other words, when you read the Old Testament, you find the fulfillment has not come yet. There is something it's waiting for. The Old Testament, when you read it, it's looking forward to it. It's, it's anticipating the fulfillment of promises. Of course, we understand it is, it's looking forward to Jesus. That's the big picture. That's the overall shape of the Old Testament. But not just the overall picture. Even when you zoom into a particular passage, just as the author of Hebrews does here with uh, various passages from the Old Testament, you will still see the person of the Son. Now, again, it's not just that you have to just open your, old, open your Bible in and, and random verses, but there are particular passages from the Old Testament that are about the Son. Well, how can you, how can you tell if some passages are about the Son and some aren't? Well, here's the filter. I'll, I'll, ta- I'll, I'll teach you the filter. First, you have to understand that Jesus is the second Adam. He is the greater Moses. Jesus is the new Israel. He is the greater Joshua. He is the greater son of David, and so on. In other words, when you read the Old Testament and when you read about these Old Testament saints, they're not the final picture. In fact, they they are a shadow of the one to come. Even if you think about David himself, David was a great king, but he was also a bad, bad man. I don't know if you knew this, right? And so I mean that in a bad way. Jesus was a, was a bad man. Excuse me. We're going to delete that from the recording. <laughs> David was a bad man. Right? And Jesus fulfills who David could have been, should have been, in a great, greater way. Okay? And so the filter we, we, can, we can use is that where, wherever... David or Adam or Israel failed, we find that the son succeeds. Wherever Moses or Joshua fell short, because after all, even though Moses and Joshua were great men, they were, at the end of the day, human beings. They were sinful. Jesus succeeds because he is the Holy One. And also, there are many passages in the Old Testament that speak of a coming king. There will be a king from the line of David in whom and through whom all the promises of God and his eternal, perfect, righteous kingdom will be established. Those kind of passages are about Jesus. Okay? I hope that explains how we can read the Old Testament Um, and see where Jesus is in the Old Testament. Even though you don't see the words Jesus in the Old Testament, it is about him. Okay, so we're going to, this is what we're going to do today. It's going to seem like a straightforward Bible study. No, I'm, I will, I'm still preaching, but we're going to take a look at these passages. Since after all, the author of Hebrews, he's laying it out for us, so we're going to learn, we're going to take a deep dive here. First, the author quotes from Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7. These two passages are in fact related to one another. The second passage, 2 Samuel 7, is one of the more 
important chapters in the Bible because there, in that chapter, is where God establishes his covenant with David, called the Davidic covenant. Now, God makes numerous covenants in the Old Testament. Uh, who is familiar with the Noahic covenant? That's one of the earlier ones. Where, where does God promise? That he gives a sign, the rainbow. What does God promise in the Noahic covenant? He says, I will not flood the world again. I will not judge the world through water again. And then the covenant after that, he makes a covenant with Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless you so that you can bless others. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you many children. I'm going to give you this land. He establishes a covenant with Israel in Mount Sinai. And the next big one after that is the covenant with David. And, and here's the thing to keep in mind with these covenants. They're not separate covenants. They're all covenants that build upon each other. And you'll notice that the, the people who's, who he's building, who he's giving the covenant to get smaller and smaller. First of all, the Noahic covenant is to all creation. Then the one to Abraham is to Abraham, his children after him. The one, to, the one after that is to Israel specifically. The one after that is to David now. Now it's, very, it's getting very specific. It's, it's to David's family. And what does God promise to David in this covenant? He says, you don't, you don't have to turn back there in 2 Samuel 7, but it, he says, your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In other words, God promises that the throne of David, which means David's kingdom... And all the kings that will come after him among his sons, right? This is how the kingdom passed from generation to generation. David's son would become king, and then the son after that would become king, and so on and so forth. The promise is that David's kingdom will last forever. You guys know how old the, uh, our, our, the American empire is? No, I'm just kidding. The United States is? We are, uh, well... If we're counting from independence, we're, t we're talking about not quite 250 years, right? And it sounds, and it feels like this, this, this uh, nation is, is well established and, you know, we might be, but in fact, if you look through history, kingdoms and empires have beginnings and they, as up till this point, they have always had ends. Usually they end after a couple hundred years. You can, look up, you can look at various empires through the centuries. They begin and then they end. Begin and end. And God's promise to David is, your kingdom, your throne, shall be established forever. Now, suffice it to say, we know that the kingdom of Israel did not last forever. We can look now, but also we can even look back. When the, when the Old Testament was completed... That's the book of Malachi. There is no king on the, on the throne. Uh, when the Old Testament is completed, in fact, there are foreigners, foreign empires who have come in, and they are ruling, and they're the ones in charge. There is no Davidic king. That's the context, by the way, for the coming of the Messiah. What does Messiah mean or Christ mean? It means anointed one. An anointed one is one who is, who is, have the ceremony of oil poured on him before he is, he becomes king. Now we know, now we know that the throne of David will be established forever, not because when you read this, when the first people re heard this prophecy from 2 Samuel 7, they thought it meant that David's son and his sons and his sons for generations in the future will continue to be kings. Well, that's not what he meant. The ultimate fulfillment of, of this promise is that the son of God, who is also the son of David, would come, live, lay down his life, and be raised up again. He would ascend into heaven and sit at the right hand of God. And that's, what, that's, what this, that's how we understand this promise to be fulfilled. That the throne of David is in fact not just a worldly kingdom of this plot of land in the Middle East, but the, the Davidic kingdom is the whole universe. 
And in fact, Jesus has promised. He is sitting on the throne right now, but he has promised that he will return, and he's going to make good on all his promises, and he will consummate his kingdom, in, 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 meaning that his kingdom will be completely and fully established. And so in making this covenant with David, Yahweh, he makes this promise, he, uh, which is quoted here. I will be to him, the king, a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, if you're reading 2 Samuel 7, you think that's about Solomon because right before that, God says, he's going to build me a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who builds, who builds Israel's temple? That's Solomon. So we think that this, initially we might think that this is about Solomon. And we think that this passage is about Solon, Solomon being the one uh, who God will treat like a son. But you know, if you know anything about Solomon, you know that he turned away from God in his later days. He, he turned away from God. He fell away from grace. And as great as Solomon was, he didn't live up to his promise, the promise that was given to him. He didn't live up to the covenant that was given to his father. And in fact, not, not only Solomon, but any of the kings that followed, even the good ones, none of them lived up to the promise that we see in this covenant until many generations later, the Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate fulfillment of this promise. Let me, let me give you a principle. Uh, you guys know what a telescope is? Telescopes, they can scope. Look. I'm looking far. I'm looking near. So in the Old Testament, you can, look at, you can look through a telescope. You're looking near at Solomon, but you can pull out and you can see Jesus. That is, that is how we can consider this passage and other passages. The Old Testament might be speaking of something that's happening near Solomon, but also you can zoom out to the far distance and see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the passage. So in the same way, Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. Coronation is when someone is crowned as king. Uh, specifically, when the kings of Judah were crowned as kings, they would sing this psalm here. And verse 7 from Psalm 2 says, The Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now when they sung that in the, in the, in the Old Testament times, they thought that that meant... The king is like a son to God. It doesn't mean that the king is literally God's son. They thought that that meant the king is, a, is like a son, and God is like a father to the king. But in these last days, we have heard and now know that the Christ, the anointed one, is not merely like a son. He is the son. He is the son of God. So that's why the author of Hebrews makes this first point from verse 5. For, which, for to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The answer, of course, to that rhetorical question is none. None of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, real quick, the author moves on to his second po point, and he, this is his second point. If the angels are not addressed by God as my son, then who or what are angels? And so the author, he paraphrases from two places in the Old Testament. Um, the first quote is from Psalm 97. And he basically quotes a passage that says that all of all creatures, all um, all the redeemed, everything that has breath, all creation is, is called to worship God. But, and included among, those, um, included among the creation is the angels. Let all God's angels worship him. And who are they supposed to worship? They are called to worship the Son of God. Uh, furthermore, in the next passage, Psalm 104, this is the fourth quote he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. That is, angels are instruments in God's hands. They are servants. And they're called to execute God's will, whether it's to be like wind blowing or it's to be like fire burning. 
That means for all their power and their majesty and their importance, angels are ultimately, at the end of the day, their servants. They serve and do God's will. And then finally, we turn to the final section here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. But of the Son, he says, and then he quotes here from Psalm 45. Psalm 45 is clearly a messianic psalm, meaning it is about the Messiah. But the thing that makes it a little different is that it is a wedding song. It's a love song. It's a love song to the Messiah. It's sung from the perspective of a bride, the bride who is going to marry the Messiah, the coming king. So, for example, verse 2 of, of Psalm 45 says, you are the most handsome of the sons of men. It's talking about the Messiah. This, again, this, this is a love song to the king. But in the middle of this psalm, very strangely or very unexpectedly, the song makes a turn in, in this exact section that is quoted by Hebrews, which is, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He was talking about this Messiah. Uh, you are the most handsome of men. And then a few verses later, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Basically, the singer seems to get mixed up because she says... To the Messiah, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. But in the next sentence, she says, therefore God has anointed you. So which one is it? Is she saying, is she speaking to the Messiah or to God? Who are you speaking to, psalmist? Are you speaking to the Messiah or are you speaking to God? By the way, the Jews, they didn't know how to really understand Psalm 45, so they... Uh, they had a lot of confusion about how to read this particular psalm. How can the psalmist call the king, who is, who is a human being, how can the psalmist call the king God? But the answer comes to us in these last days by the revelation of the Son. We know that the Son is God. They're the same thing. The Son is God. He is the Son of God. The Son is the Messiah. His, his kingdom is forever. His, he loves righteousness and he rules with uprightness. Therefore, God, his God, has anointed him. Again, above and beyond angels, the Son is highly exalted. His throne is eternal. And that, that theme of him, him being ruling and over an eternal kingdom is what leads the, the author of Hebrews to quote in this, in this sixth quote from Psalm 102. Now, if you read Psalm 102, you'll find that it doesn't seem to be about the Messiah at all. Psalm 102 is one of those kind of, it follows this theme of uh, the person, he's struggling, he's, he's, he needs help, and he, pr and he prays to God, and... And, and the psalmist takes comfort in the fact that God is eternal. God doesn't change. That's the quoted section here. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. Uh, you laid the heavens. The heavens are the work of your hands. Even the earth and the, and the heavens, they're going to perish. But you, God, you're going to remain. They all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, they will wear out. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will have no end. So this, the psalmist takes confidence that God is eternal. He's unchangeable. So if you're tracking with me, the, the obvious question is, how is that about the Messiah? Well, it's not directly, in fact. But how, if you read the previous passage, we know that the Messiah, his throne is forever and ever. And we know that the Messiah, he also, he is God. We address him as God. He, so if we combine the two together, if we understand the Messiah is God, his throne is forever, then we can also say that he is the creator. He is, 
he laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. Even though the creation will perish, he will remain. We can say of the Son, just as of God the Creator, that he is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. That's why we can take confidence that his throne is forever. Um, and finally, the, there's a final quote from Psalm 110, and that's verse 13 here. This is one of the most well, this is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, Psalm 110. Even Jesus quotes from this psalm um, at the, at, in the last week of his life, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes came to him to test him. And if you remember, Jesus was able to fight them off, not fight them off physically, but he, he knew the word better than them. He knew God's will better, and he was able to fend off their trick questions. But after they were done giving their trick questions, Jesus has a question for them. And it's not a trick question, but he does have a question for them. And he quotes from Psalm 110. And he says to them, uh, if you remember, if David, if the Messiah is David's son, then how can David say, call him my Lord? How does David say of his own son, my Lord? Like, for example, guys, I am never going to call my own son, my Lord. You understand this? How can David say of his, of his son, my Lord? And uh, the scribes, the, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they were confused. They didn't know. They didn't know how to answer that. And this was not a trick question. Well, we know why G David was able to call his son, my Lord. It's because it turns out his son was the son of God. And so this is the final, this is the final quote that we see here in, in, in our passage. And what does this say about the Messiah? God will say to the Messiah, sit at my right hand. What does that mean? Sit in the, on the throne. Sit at the seat of power, the seat of authority and, and honor until I put all things, including all your enemies, under your feet. Who but the, to the Son of God will God say this to? He does not say this to angels. He says this to his own son, Oni. In closing, the author of Hebrews reiterates the point that angels are ministering spirits sent out by God. And what, are they, what is their job? To serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. The angels' jobs is to serve for our sake. Angels are sent by God to serve you those of you who will inherit salvation. Now, as amazing as that is, I think it's worth pausing here to recall what Jesus said about himself. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that means that not only do angels serve us, but the Son of God himself also came to serve us. Here's the amazing thing about salvation. It's not just that we're served by angels so that we might inherit salvation, but the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who shall, shall sit on the throne forever and ever, the one whom all, all God's angels bow down to him, the Holy One of Israel, he also came to serve us to give his life as a ransom for you and for me. If that is true, then how, how should we, we respond? How should we live? Shall we, shall we understand Jesus to be our servants? Excuse me, Jesus to be our servant? Of course not. Having received so, so great a salvation, how should we respond but to give thanks and to worship him, to join with all creatures here and, and here below and with all the heavenly hosts above that we should respond by worshiping our king who is the son of God, Jesus Christ. Um, let us pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word. 
We thank you that by it, we can know you. Not just know about you, know facts about you, but we can truly know you. We see, Lord, what a glorious God you are. We see that even from eternity past, that, Lord, how you have, how you have um, foretold everything, you have planned um, how you, will, you would save us sinners by sending your Son to die for us. Lord, we, we ask that you would enable us not only to know these truths, but that these truths would shape our hearts and that we would truly submit ourselves to the King. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.